Hello again, welcome back to part two, the second in a series of five videos on glass. And as you can see on the title slide today, we've got again our um, friendly coronavirus sculpture. I want to pick up where we left off last time. So essentially, I'm going to look again at what a glass is and how it's made. So just to finish off those topics but to dive inside the glass a little bit. So we're going to look at some of the experimental methods we can use to determine all of those aspects of the arrangement of atoms and so on that I talked about last time. And again, as last time, uh, I've got a lovely green screen um, background behind me. Uh, this again is an image of a piece of glass artwork created by um, local artist Grace Ason. Uh, and I'm very grateful to Grace for allowing me to use these images from her website. The details of that are in that little oval on the slide that you can see in front of you. So let's see where we're going to get to. But first, I think I really ought to just uh, reiterate the key things about the structure of a glass. Now, you'll remember that I said that everything was based upon this tetrahedral arrangement of silicon in the centre with four oxygen atoms around the outside. And that the difference between uh, a crystal, quartz, uh, would be the crystal we're talking about, and a glass, is simply that we allow angles like this to change a little bit and angles like this to flex a little bit. And we're just talking about a few degrees uh, either way, and that's enough to destroy the crystalline structure in the sense that we can no longer reliably predict where all of the atoms are in our crystal because they're all arranged in an identical pattern in three dimensions. We instead retain some semblance of the local relationship, so silicon atoms will still be surrounded by four oxygens and two of those oxygens will actually, as this one is in the centre here, create a bridge to neighbouring tetrahedra, but beyond those few interatomic spaces, uh, the material will, in essence, have lost memory of where the atoms are. So it'll become disordered, and I talked about disordered materials and amorphous materials. And classically, glass is um, a prototypically amorphous solid. So let's dive in and see uh, where we get to uh, in this talk. Well, we're going to dive back into history again. Uh, and this is um, a medieval view of glass making. It's um, around about the 7th century. And as is commonly the case uh, back then, we've got everything from getting the raw materials uh, up at the top here, uh, transporting and processing them, and then down into our little um, factory here where the ingredients are being melted. And you remember for our basic soda lime glass, we needed um, silica. So we need silicon and oxygen, and that's just sand. Uh, we needed also some sodium, which came from marine plants that have been um, dried and powdered up, seaweed essentially, and that gave us uh, the sodium required to lower the melting point uh, of the silica. So it enabled us to melt the sand at temperatures not at 1500 degrees, which would have been completely impossible for the sort of furnaces around at the time, but to melt it at a few hundred degrees, so perhaps in the range of, of 500 degrees centigrade. Uh, and they would have added calcium as well, remember. This came from lime, uh, so it could be processed from, from chalk. So it's calcium carbonate, essentially, the form that it went in. And that gave us this broader temperature range over which the glass could be worked. So we can really start to get glass blowing, taking off now because we've got a material that will stay soft enough over a wide enough temperature range that we can do things with it while it's cooling down. And you can see glass blowing processes going on uh, um, down here at the bottom. 
we move forward a little bit in time so this is now um, the early 1800s this picture on the left here and it's set actually in a glassworks in Bavaria now Bavaria was actually quite famous for its glass manufacturing uh, and you can see that things haven't changed very much the clothing has changed uh, it's rather nice to see people actually wearing a little bit of protective health and safety gear here um, these wooden paddles are on this chap's um, uh, legs here that he can rest hot things on for short periods of time but the essence of the technology hasn't changed uh, we're still taking globs of glass out of a crucible and a furnace um, and um, blowing through a hollow tube in order to turn that glob of glass into a hollow vessel a bottle or a drinking uh, vessel of some sort for instance and we skip forward again several centuries this is a picture that I took during a, um, a tour at the Dartington Crystal uh, Glassworks um, this picture actually was based at their Torrington Centre and probably 1980s I can't really remember precisely but you can see again that although uh, well the fashions have definitely changed um, and the furnaces are now powered by uh, gas flames rather than in this case it would have been charcoal everything else is much the same these guys are still pulling uh, gobs of um, soft glass molten glass out of a furnace and blowing through hollow tubes in order to make particular shapes um, so all the way through this process although the technology behind it the methods behind it might have changed a little bit uh, the actual process of blowing glass really hasn't changed um, for well over a thousand years more likely two two and a half thousand years but then we get to industrial sized glass now to make a window pane for instance uh, originally we'd have taken one of these um, gobbets of molten glass on the end of a pole from a furnace as we saw in those glass blowing pictures earlier but now instead of blowing it we'd have spun this rod around and just like spinning water out of your washing uh, in a washing machine that would have spread the softened glass out into a cylinder so we'd be basically um, you know as you would with uh, pastry for pasta or something we'd be spinning it out to get a bigger area uh, and making it thinner in the process and then that would have been allowed to cool and it would have been cut into rectangular shapes and that would have provided the glass uh, for our windows it would have been probably leaded together to make a large pane much as you can see in in an old cathedral for instance um, although in this case clear glass rather than colored glass and the bit in the middle of course uh, would have been much thicker and a bit knobbly uh, that would have been the cheap cut it was called a bullseye um, and those would have gone into uh, houses to let light in where the folk couldn't afford anything more uh, couldn't afford any flatter thinner sheets of glass from the uh, from the cut disc um, so those bullseyes then were the cheapest bit uh, if you want to buy a bullseye now to have a bit of decorative glass in your room um, uh, front door or something actually it's quite expensive area for area uh, compared to um, conventional glass panes so that was okay up to a point but now if you want a large area of glass and you'd like it to be moderately smooth and certainly you, if you wanted it shaped you need to do something quite quite different so this black and white image here is of a Victorian glass blowing uh, works and I've circled it in, in yellow here so that hopefully you can pick it out but this is an enormous blown glass cylinder now this wasn't blown uh, you know by some chap blowing through a tube uh, this you know there would have been the assistance of some bellows at this stage uh, human lungs would have struggled I think to get a shape that large and you see how large it is 
Uh, here's one uh, Victorian gent down here. Here's another one over here. Um, so, you know, maybe one meters 80 tall. So this is several meters long, this glass cylinder that has been blown. So what happens then to make glass panes is relatively straightforward. The ends are cut off and when it's soft it's quite easy to cut. You could actually use a large pair of shears to just snip through it. Um, and then the whole cylinder would have been slit lengthwise and laid while it was still soft uh, onto a wooden mould, a former. And then the glass would simply have relaxed in its softened state into the shape of this wooden former underneath. Uh, so you'd have ended up with something that was either flat or curved or whatever shape you'd chosen to make your, uh, your wooden mould out of. And you could get then fairly large single sheets of glass uh, for your whatever your architectural purpose was. And actually this was the means of creating all of the glass uh, that went into Prince Albert's Crystal Palace for the 1851 exhibition. Uh, and there's a contemporary um, painting of the scene inside, as you can see here, it was enormous, as you probably know, uh, taller than mature trees, uh, but all of the sheets of glass curved or flat uh, that made up the Crystal Palace will have been created by the method that we've just talked about here. So blowing a cylinder, chopping the ends off, slicing it along its length and just letting it fold gently into whatever shape you want it to be. Uh, and this is called slump moulding for fairly obvious reasons. We're allowing the glass uh, to slump into its mould and in fact glass artists still use um, slump moulding methods on occasion if, if their um, artwork calls for it. So until relatively modern times this was the way of creating large sheets of glass to go into uh, windows and so on. And so it was good but of course it wasn't perfect. The surface would have been slightly crinkled if you've ever seen any um, you know Victorian or later glass, um, it always has these slight ripples and imperfections to it. It's actually one of the things that makes it attractive, but it doesn't make it particularly good for clarity of vision through to the other side. So I mentioned then the, um, the UK's grand contribution to the scheme of things, and that came from Alistair Pilkington in the 1950s. And he came up with this absolutely ingenious way of making exceptionally large, in fact almost arbitrarily large, sheets of extremely flat and uniformly thick glass. And this is the flute glass process. Uh, and what, um, what Alistair Pilkington realised, of course, is that if you want something that's really smooth and flat, well, you know, that's the surface of a liquid. That's what we're talking about here. And so he, after, I mean, it took many, many years, but essentially he came up with this idea of pouring the molten glass from the furnace onto uh, a bath of molten tin. So the tin's at, you know, 600-ish degrees centigrade. It's, because it's molten, it has a flat and perfectly smooth surface. So we simply pour in the glass at one end of our production line and it floats on this bath of molten tin uh, and goes across to the other side by which time it's spread, it's been sort of rolled even, to produce uniformly thick but perfectly smooth um, sheets of glass. And this is a continual process. As long as you're pouring it in at one end from a furnace and collecting it at the other end once it's cooled and solidified, then you can just keep producing flat sheets of glass. So this float glass process was really quite revolutionary and, and you know, absolutely um, 
all of our window panes and uh, shop fronts and glass counters and glass coffee tables and all the other things you've got of that nature will have come originally from a float glass process of this sort. So developed in the UK in the 1950s and now used, of course, uh, worldwide. And we can see their beauty in various places. This is actually um, a very romantic location. This is a toilet high up in the Shard in London, um, sufficiently high that they don't bother about curtains and blinds and so on. Um, we have London, the River Thames, in view down below. Um, it's a, it's an interesting take on the uh, on the concept of the toilet. But there we go. Now, glass is a fairly complex material. I showed you a static computer model in the first vid video, just showing you what it might look like inside. This actually came from. Um, a university student um, at the university I used to teach at. I'm going to sort of keep clicking this and keeping it going. Uh, it's his computerized model of a particular glass. This is a glass that has metal atoms in that are shown in green here. Um, but the silvery parts are silicon, the red parts are oxygen, so it's got all of those characteristics of uh, the sort of glass that we looked at earlier. Um, and this is a really tricky puzzle to solve. Not only do we need to get a handle on all the angles and distances and so on associated with our um, network forming materials, so silicon, phosphorus, aluminium, boron, those are the elements that I listed as our network formers. But also in this case, we'd like to know, in fact, it's crucial for this particular material to know where the metal atoms are in this system, because that's controlling in this particular case, uh, the optical properties of the glass that was being studied. Well, how are we going to approach that? This is, you know, complex problems require really quite sophisticated approaches if we're going to produce answers to them. And you know as Snoopy of course shows us here the answer is is simply to put one paw in front of the other to take one step at a time and to add pieces of information jigsaw fashion if you like until we build up enough uh, understanding to be able to answer some of the uh, some of the particularly important questions. So here's our glass in the middle and, and this is a, an image of the work done, you know, in the sort of research that I was engaged in when I was still working. All sorts of experimental methods and computer simulation, none of which I need to tell you about here. I simply want to illustrate the fact that um, we have to apply a lot of experimental, experimental and computational methods we need to put all of those results together in some sort of um, coherent and cogent way in order to understand this very complex material that we've been left with. No longer the simplicity of our crystal structure, but now something that is amorphous, that is disordered at the atomic level. Now I'm just going to pick out um, um, one of these methods. In fact, it's a pair of methods here. Uh, and it's a technique called diffraction, and we can do diffraction both with neutrons and with x-rays. I'll focus a little bit more on x-rays just because um, I happen to have some nice images of those, but I'll show you the results of some neutron work later on if, uh, you know, in a, another video in this series. So let's just have a look at how diffraction works uh, and where we might do those experiments. Um, Keep in mind the issue that we've got. We're looking at the arrangement of atoms in a material. So, you know, obviously we can't see those with our eye. Even an optical microscope is no good. We can just about see uh, the arrangement of atoms, certainly in a crystalline system, if we use a very advanced electron microscope. 
but actually as I say we need to do some sophisticated diffraction experiments using very elaborate um, sources of radiation <coughs> excuse me uh, in order to see what we're looking at at an atomic level and the particular um, sources of radiation that uh, me and my research group and our collaborators used um, are shown in these aerial shots here. So this top one is showing the uh, Rutherford Appleton lab. This is in Oxfordshire in the UK and it has the most wonderful neutron source over here in the background and this is a place I, um, I used to work for some years way back in the um, um, early and mid part of the 1980s and a more recent addition is this synchrotron ring here. Now this is a way of producing amazingly bright um, beams of x-rays and we can do astonishing things uh, with synchrotron x-rays. But it's not just in the UK, these are actually all over the world and this is another pair of facilities that my research team used a lot. Uh, this is in um, just outside Grenoble in the south of France. You can see the Alps in the background there. Uh, the rivers Isère and the Drac flow to either side of this site. It's a wonderful setting. Uh, but again, we've got a source of neutrons here and here's their um, synchrotron source of X-rays. This is the European synchrotron radiation source. And as the name implies, this is jointly funded by um, um, well of the order of 20 countries predominantly European uh, they share the cost of this. Well it looks idyllic of course but actually um, what the scientist ends up seeing is the inside of a of a room with a lot of computer screens but just to show you how this thing works as it were um, in terms of gathering information here's a section of our synchrotron ring going around here so this is this donut shaped construction um, and at a tangent from this ring periodically we will be able to take off x-rays so this is where the radiation is coming and it goes through um, a whole set of optical devices which select different x-ray wavelengths and um, shape the x-rays so that it's a nice well-defined beam of x-rays and so on um, and from there it's passed into uh, this other little room where the sample is held so that's held in here and the x-rays hit it and then on the other side of that we'll have a whole bunch of things that are detecting the x-rays that come out the other side so we know precisely what's gone into our sample and we measure what comes out the other side and then of course that appears on our little computer screens over here. Now these are expensive experiments to do uh, so to get access to these which is highly competitive um, we have to be able to guarantee that we will work 24 hours a day for as long as they've given us access. So of course it requires a team of researchers to do that we're working in shifts around the clock collecting the data. And this is a lovely cartoon that the Diamond Light Source, which is the UK synchrotron that I showed you an aerial shot of earlier, um, have allowed me to show for how diffraction works. So this is showing you the process. It's going to run over and over. So here's our x-rays coming in from the synchrotron here. They get shaped. We select what sort of energy we want. Um, and then finally, after we've done all the pre-conditioning of the x-rays, it hits our sample. And once it hits our sample, uh, it scatters those uh, x-rays and we detect them um, in, um, in some sophisticated x-ray detector on this far side. So here we are. So here's where our x-rays came through and produced a diffraction pattern. So the key thing here, uh, I'll illustrate in our next slide. I'll just let this simulation run through one more time just to show you what's happening. Okay. <coughs> 
So if I do this in diagrammatic form with a rather silly sample of glass in the middle there, here's our source of x-rays um, and we're causing that beam of x-rays to hit our glass sample. Uh, some of which will go straight through, we're not worried about those, but some would have been scattered by the atoms in this glass sample. And they'll be scattered at one angle or another. This is just showing one particular angle at which some x-rays have been scattered. It could be you know, various angles all the way around here. And then we have some x-ray detector up here that's picking them up, so it's measuring the intensity the number, if you like, of x-rays that have been scattered in that particular direction. So all we need to do now is to have a series of detectors or one big detector that tells us what's happening all the way around here. So where are these scattered x-rays landing up? And the essence of it, as I said just now, is that provided we know precisely what's going into our sample, and we measure accurately and precisely what's coming out the other side, we can use that information to work back into the middle. So what we need to ask ourselves is where are the atoms in this glass such that they could scatter these x-rays into these angles? So that's the essence of a diffraction experiment. We have information of what's going in, we have information about what's coming out, and we need to now work out what our material in the middle has been doing in order to produce one from the other. That's a diffraction experiment. So let's look at these again. Um, here's schematically, here's our experiment. So here's our sample. And these are x-rays or neutrons or electrons. We can do diffraction with all sorts of things coming out. We're detecting, detecting them. So as a function of this angle, so as we move our detector around, that's what's plotted on this x-axis, this is the intensity we measure. So we measure a lot down here near where uh, we've got the um, straight through beam of x-rays as it were, the x-rays that aren't scattered. And then we measure progressively less as our detector tracks around at higher and higher angles. But you'll notice it's not a smooth line, it's actually got lumps and bumps in it. And that's the effect of our atoms in our glass moving those x-rays around as it were, scattering them in particular ways. So we do a little bit of mathematical processing on this. We need to normalize it and various other things that we have to do. And we end up getting those lumps and bumps extracted from the underlying uh, intensity. And we end up with uh, a curve like this. This is something called a structure factor. <coughs> Excuse me. And another mathematical process applied to this will give us some information that's back into our real world of lengths, distances. And this is telling us, this is something called a radial distribution function, this is telling us about the probability of finding an atom at a particular distance from another one. So as we can see here, we've got no zero probability at the beginning, which won't surprise anybody, we can't have two atoms in the same place at the same time. But at a certain distance along here, we get a sharp increase in the probability of finding another atom, and then it drops back again, and then we get another slightly broader and lower uh, rise in probability, so there's another atom um, at a greater distance, and so on and so forth, right, as we go through. But this is an amorphous material, a disordered material, remember, and that explains why we actually lose distinctiveness in this curve as we go to larger and larger distances. So this is measuring the radius, it's measuring the distance from whatever imaginary atom we've got at the origin here, further and further away from that atom.
So let's have a look at this uh, and what it means physically. So what we need to imagine now um, is that we are taking our glass and we're going to sit ourselves on an atom inside that glass sample. Doesn't matter which, just pick one atom and sit on it. And we're going to look around us. This is showing us in uh, two dimensions, but of course in reality this is in three. But we find that from the centre of the atom that we're sat on, there are no other atoms um, until we get a little bit beyond the diameter of that atom. Because of course, as I said, we can't have two atoms in the same place at the same time. So a little bit beyond the atom that we're sat on, we we'll start seeing our nearest neighbour atoms, right? More atoms. And they will be at some distance or other approximately a diameter or a diameter plus a bit away from our central atom. So if we just look at the positions of the centre of the atoms, we've actually got a, um, a band in which they can exist around here. And that's actually coming from the width of that curve there. And if we go out a bit further, we start seeing the centres of a second set of neighbouring atoms. So the ones out beyond these first neighbours. Uh, and those, you know, are at um, distances that are spread over a slightly wider range of distances. It's a broader ring we're looking at. And again, this comes, uh, uh, gives us here this, the breadth of this second peak and so on and so on. We can now draw a third ring which would encompass uh, you know these atoms out around here and a fourth ring which would bring in that one for instance that one and that one. Um, but because there is this variation in angles and so on that I talked about earlier on, the spread over which our neighbouring atoms can be sitting in terms of distance gets broader and broader and broader. And so our peaks get wider and wider and wider. Now this is one atom that we've sat on. So now you need to do this thought experiment all over again and you need to sit on every single atom in the glass in turn and go through this same exercise. Where are my nearest neighbour atoms? At what distance and over what spread of distances? Where are my second neighbour atoms? And so on and so on. And then we take all of that information and we average it together. And when we've done that, we get what this curve essentially represents. So it is the average distribution of atoms around a central atom. So our central atom is here the average distribution of other atoms at various distances from that central atom. Okay? And from that piece of information we can start to derive some really quite important facts and figures about the structure of our glass. I'm not going to go into detail in this, this will require a little bit of mathematics. Uh, we can start with some trigonometry uh, and so on, but I'm, you know, I'm not going to go there. What I do need to point out for you is the length scale here. This um, graph has been plotted uh, using a distance called an angstrom. Uh, it's an old fashioned unit these days, but an angstrom is quite a useful unit because it's approximately the diameter of a hydrogen atom, so the diameter of the smallest atom in the periodic table. So it's quite a useful ruler to measure all sorts of other things. And we can tell one piece of information immediately from this curve. We can tell that the average distance to your nearest neighbour, if you were on an atom in our glass, uh, is actually given by uh, the distance between the origin here and the centre of this peak. So this we could describe um, as a bond length, the distance between two 
neighboring atoms. So immediately we've got a piece of information we can use. That process takes a lot, right? It takes um, a lot of puzzling. The experiment itself might last a day or two. Analyzing and interpreting the data will, you know, perhaps consume the next month and some very intensive um, computer based analysis. And it takes, I have to say, a brain somewhat larger than, uh, than Homer Simpson's. Um, but, um, you know, this is not an impossible task. There's some very talented um, research students I've worked with over the past who've tackled this extraordinarily successfully. So here's a typical research scientist um, undertaking the analysis of this diffraction data. Of course, this is how we all looked when we were doing our experiments. In reality, actually, more like this. This is uh, an image taken from the cover of um, uh, the annual report of one of those facilities I showed you aerial shots of earlier, um, two of the PhD students from um, um, almost two decades ago now uh, who um, are just about loading up a new sample to stick in the beam and do some more extra experiments. These were some extremely talented um, scientists. I was very fortunate to have them and people like them in my research group. Now in the first video I introduce you to the Venus flower basket. Um, and um, I told you that its skeleton was made of glass. And at the time I said you'd have to take my word for it, but I would show you some information that would back up that claim. So I'm going to do that now uh, with a colleague of mine. Um, we did an X-ray diffraction experiment on some of the fibers that came from the ends uh, of this um, Venus flower basket that I showed you uh, just to see whether it looked like the sort of picture that I showed you earlier on. Um, so let's have a look at what we got. So here's the pattern. So you remember we're looking at the distance from some atom at the origin, an arbitrary atom at the origin. Uh, and we're going out in these units of angstrom, remember, diameters of a hydrogen atom. And you can see that the probability of finding a neighbouring atom is very low until we get to uh, this distance here, which actually turns out to be 1.6 angstrom. And then we get a very high probability of finding another neighbour on average. And it drops back down again, and then it goes up down, up and down, all the way through, and eventually these wiggles decay away. But this distance, you remember, this is what I told you corresponded to the distance between neighbouring atoms. Now, beautifully, given the claim that I made, 1.6 angstroms is precisely the distance between a silicon and an oxygen atom that is bonded to it. So it's the silicon oxygen bond length. So we're on to a good start here. It gets a little bit more complex further on though. So the obvious thing to do is to produce another pattern like this, but now from a sample of silica glass that we know uh, is uh, a pure material. And that's been done. That's been done many, many times. Uh, I've taken this from a research paper um, by um, Adam Ledbetter and his colleagues um, and published way back you'll see in 1994. This uh, diffraction experiment I should say was undertaken by um, a colleague of mine Emma Barney um, who's now um, running her own research group at the um, University of Nottingham uh, and she did this for me back in 2011. So let's have a look. Let's compare one for one. The scales um, are slightly stretched one compared to another, but we're running, you can see, from 0 to 10 angstroms on both of them. Um, what we really need to do is to look at the positions and the relative heights. And we need to match one to the other. 
So this is a pure silica glass. This is the glass or a tiny piece of glass from our Venus flower basket. So here's our first one at 1.6 angstrom and that remember is associated with the distance between silicon and oxygen atoms. Then we have a low one coming in here and it's reflected in this sample over here. This is actually the distance between um, an oxygen and another oxygen through a silicon. So it's the distance between, if I go back to my tetrahedra, this oxygen and this one over here. Right? So it's that group of three and it's the distance between those two. Um, and then we get to a slightly larger peak. Yes, here it is over here. And this is, you'll see it's listed as a silicon through oxygen to another silicon. Right? So that peak is giving the distance between this silicon atom all the way through the oxygen to that silicon atom. You can see what we're getting here. We're slowly building up um, a lot of information uh, about where our atoms are in terms of distance one from another. Now these are not precise as in these peaks have some width to them, right? So remember what we said about the difference between a crystal uh, and an amorphous material, a glass um, or quartz to, gr to glass as a, as the, as a comparison. Um, so this is telling us, for instance, that actually the length, the distance between a silicon and oxygen atom uh, is changing slightly. Right. I mean, it's actually very slightly. We're talking about, you know, a percent or two. But nevertheless, that's enough now to say that this isn't just a sharp line. This is actually something that has some width to it. There is a variation in the distance. And likewise, there's a variation in the distance between these two. Well, why is that? Uh, because actually we can now get slight changes in that angle. So that causes this distance to change. And we go on and on and on as we move further and further out. Um, and we get out to this third peak, which you remember was one silicon through an oxygen to another one. Uh, that's broader still. You'd expect that because there's a variation in this distance and this distance of a percent or two. And so therefore there has to be a variation in that distance. Um, and of course this angle can change as well, which also changes the distance between those two. And we can progress this comparison um, further and further out in distance uh, with this sample here. So I hope I've convinced you um, that this chunk of pure silica glass, which will have been made uh, by melting material in a, in a crucible, um, so, you know, the high temperature furnace route is mirrored really quite well by this glass grown by a deep sea sponge in cold seawater um, through chemical processes in its body. And I think that's actually quite a remarkable fact that nature is producing this amazingly high quality glassy material without the need for furnaces and all the technology that goes with it. And we will come back to that. We'll come back to that in the final video of the series because it's it's really quite important. Uh, if we can in some way mimic this chemical process for making a glass then actually a whole range of novel uses uh, opens up before us. And that's it. Video number two is finished. Uh, I've changed the um, image that I'm using uh, now. We've, um, we've now gone to uh, a window in the cathedral in Strasbourg. And this is a picture that I took a few years ago uh, when I spent um, um, a day in, in Strasbourg and uh, got the chance to go into the cathedral for a short period of time.
uh, and capture this um, incredibly beautiful window. But anyway, that is the end of video two. Uh, thank you for watching it. Um, and I'll see you next time when we pick up this topic again and move on to different areas uh, in our study of glass. I'll see you then.